Lord, you are merciful. And you are not surprised when your children sin. And seeing that need, you have given a perfect and sufficient answer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is by His blood that we are set free, we are redeemed, but it also paves the way to draw near to You. So Father, thank You for this opportunity that we can lay those things down at Your feet and know that they need not be an obstacle or a shackle to us anymore. And we can draw near to You. Please bless our time in the Word. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. So we're actually picking up in a second part of a, of a two-part series about the law. What was the giving of the law? A lot of people have misconstrued the law. Now before we step forward, everybody needs a Bible, right? Yes? Am I the only one who thinks that? Okay. And everybody needs a pen, right? If for no other reason it says Grace Bible Church, that's why you need this pen. Has everybody got a pen? Okay. And Sandy, I like you. I'm not going to throw it. Yeah, well, that's okay. Tom, do you need a pen? Okay. <laughs> it's when you're hoping there's feathers on it like a dart, you can sail it. There you go. Thanks. That's okay. I love What I love about Tom is Tom will sometimes stop. I don't love that, that he stops in. Um, I love that he goes by my office and gets a bunch of pens, and then he goes out and he gives them to everybody that he meets. I love that. That's great. So... Does everybody have notes? I'll be referring to them a little bit today. Again, they are for your personal study throughout the week to further reinforce what we're talking about. But something interesting that I want us to see is maybe to pick up with what we left off with last time. At the top of your notes, we always do this primer so that everybody's got their mind straight about what we're looking at. We've been going through the Bible from the very beginning, looking at the major events that take place, and there are five truths that we have found firmly established in the word of god let's go through them quickly number one what you hold in your hand the bible is how god wants to reveal himself to you this is what makes the ministry of the gideon so pivotal it is god's revelation of himself now with that firm conviction i'm sure that's a reason why they pass those out because it makes a difference because it's actually god saying something and he wants us to know it number two god is the eternal sovereign creator he's always been he always will be he is and he rules ultimately his rule is over all things all that he creates is good and all that he does is consistent with his character the next one man is a responsible agent held to a moral standard when you and i sin you can't blame your weird uncle who liked to go ice fishing with only his socks on you can't do it he was weird, and that's his problem, and he's responsible for it. But as far as it having an effect or being used as an excuse for why you do what you do or to excuse sin, it's impossible. We are responsible. Sin originates within a person separating us from God. Where does sin come from? We don't need to be trained to sin. Good googly yesterday. The terrible twos reared their head. You don't need to be trained to sin. I wonder if we don't need to stop in 1 John 1, 9 again, right? Last one, God declares one righteous by faith alone, apart from works. By faith alone. This is a lot of what we're going to be honing in today because of how a lot of people have viewed the law. Of course, we know that when we deal with God's interaction with Abraham, Abraham believed God and he was declared what? righteous you are righteous for one reason and one reason only you responded to what god said you believed the truth that he put out in front of you that's the very bare bones where we find in the bible so here are some things i want us to look at number one when we when we go back and we talk about the law and we pick up where we left off last week i know that might be weird if you're here just this time and you weren't here last time please go listen to it online but when we talk about what that is Understand, number one, that the law given to Israel was never a means of gaining acceptance with God. If you remember in Exodus 4, 
God calls them my firstborn son. They're already fully accepted. It is not until three months later when they are led out into the wilderness that then they receive instruction for living. Now, why is this important? Because that historical event paints the picture of a truth that we have. And that truth is, is that one does not in any way merit an acceptance with God. However, after believing what he has said and being accepted by God, you are then given marching orders for how we are to live life. To mess that up is to take the mountain in Sinai and to stick it in the middle of Egypt right next to the pyramids. Does that that make sense to everybody? Is that a good visual? No? Who's awake? Okay, praise God. So you get that, right? It's to take obedience and put it in before the declaration of being a son. Well, if the historical event in the Old Testament doesn't understand that, why do we keep messing up the gospel by and large across evangelicalism? It makes no sense. The gospel that saves people is completely free of works. The gospel that is often being promoted today is something that is known as lordship salvation. If you notice the front of your notes, the second paragraph there, I have something for you. There's a quotation about middle way down in that paragraph. Lordship salvation faith goes beyond trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior. Lordship faith includes obeying him as Lord as a condition of eternal life. They have included obedience in their definition and understanding of faith. Therefore, lordship faith requires works as a necessary condition. Or to say, well, you better do this and this and this in order to be saved about keeping the law. What we're actually doing is what is called front-loading the gospel. Until you check off the grocery list, you can't check out. That's the idea. Now, that's a scary, scary restriction to put on a message of eternal life when we talk about it is a free gift of God. In fact, I've actually heard people talk about the gospel as the free gift that will cost you everything. Aren't you glad Christmas isn't like that? Family gatherings get weird all of a sudden. The free gift that will cost you everything. It's scary to think that we talk out of both sides of our mouths and we don't pay attention to what the Scripture says teaches now it's no secret that we have a sin problem right this is educational national geographic why we lie you've never read anything till you read a pagan perspective that is devoid of god as to why the human condition is one of lying so let me read a little bit to you our capacity for dishonesty is as fundamental to us as our need to trust others, which ironically makes us terrible at detecting lies. Now here's the thing, are they wrong? Is lying fundamental to us? Yeah, why? Because we're all born sinners, absolutely. So they get that perspective. Being deceitful is woven into our very fabric, so much so that it would be truthful to say that no lie is human. That, sorry, that to lie is human. The ubiquity of lying was first documented systematically by Bella DiPaolo. Now, this all sounds like snore stuff, but stick with me. A social psychologist at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Two decades ago, DiPaolo and her colleagues asked 147 adults to jot down for a week every instance they tried to mislead someone. Makes you want to go over to Walmart and get you one of those little flip pads and put it right here, doesn't it? No! No! The researchers found that the subjects lied on average one or two times a day. Most of these truths were innocuous, intended to hide one's inadequacies or to protect the feelings of others. Our ability as a society to separate truth from lies is under unprecedented threat. It's very interesting they use the word truth because they never define what truth is. I think that's interesting. Also, there's a chart that they have included in there. Mitch was able to find it online. This is a really good-looking chart. Why we lie? Here's the pie chart for it. Number one reason, protect yourself. You did something wrong, and you're always trying to cover up. You're always trying to mask or shield your inadequacies to people. Now, this is just one of ten commandments that we're given out. And I guarantee you, this is probably the one that we find most acceptable in our lives. That's why we point it out. 
The next closest reason, economic advantage. If it's not covering your reputation, it's to fill your pocketbook. She talks about how in sixth grade there was a development of lying and her and her friend were honing their craft of lying. The lies that my friend and I told were nothing out of the ordinary for kids our age. Like learning to walk and talk, lying is something of a developmental milestone. Anybody celebrate the first time your kid lied? We were wanted to be there for the first walk, the first step, right? We wanted to be there for the first time they verbalized a word. But anybody, honey, did you just hear that? He lied. Man, oh, where's the phone? Let's take a picture of this. You are not chronicling that moment. But notice that the problem of the perspective of the reporter is lying is normal. Let me ask you a question. Is lying normal? Do you realize that lying is abnormal? In fact, if we want to talk about what normal is, we go back to Genesis 1-2, right? That's normal. The introduction of sin, abnormal. When Jesus comes and he makes all things right, normal. Everybody see how that works? Very important that we grasp that. I thought this was interesting how they ended the article. What then might be the best way to impede the the fleet-footed advance of untruths into our collective lives? I love it. What's the answer? How do we deal with this situation? Obviously, it's a problem. It's a milestone, but it's a problem. How do we deal with it? The answer isn't clear. You know what this tells me? They don't believe that truth is a person. They believe it's an abstract thought and they don't believe it's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a problem. That's a massive problem. Sin's a problem. So now here's the question. How does the church relate to the law? Good question to ask, right? I found an interesting thing in your notes here. If you'll turn over to the second page, just to take a look. Some of you are familiar with Arnold Fruchtenbaum. If anything, his last name is fun to say, right? (laughs) But he is a Messianic Jewish scholar and author, and he's documented some reasons as to why the law is. So notice there's a little chart there on your second page kind of lined out. Number one, in relation to God, the law reveals his holiness. It's his righteous standard spelled out in perfection. Number two, In relation to Israel, it keeps Israel as a distinct people. I'm going to tell you this. It's real important. The law wasn't given to us. It was given to Israel. Not to us. Not to you and me. It's not to us. It convicts us. It condemns us. It is the perfection of God in which we could never keep. But it wasn't given to you as a rule for how to conduct your life and achieve intimacy with God. It's not what it was given for. B, to provide a rule of life for the Old Testament saints. C, to provide an individual and corporate worship. D, that by doing them, they would live long in the land. The Israelites living in the land was conditioned upon them keeping this law so that they maintained intimacy with God. Why is that? Well, in Deuteronomy 4, we're told that when the nations will look at Israel, who is keeping this law, they will all marvel and they will say, there has been no one like the God that you have who is so righteous and gives you such amazing standards. He's given you such incredible judgments. There's no one like your God. By them living out the law, it exalts God amongst the pagan nations who do not have the law. Number three. In relations to Gentiles, the law serves as a middle wall of partition and thus kept them strangers to the unconditional Jewish covenants so as not to partake of Jewish spiritual blessings as Gentiles but only as proselytes to Mosaic Judaism. And you just said, what in the world did you just say? Because I got it in front of my face and I don't know what it said. What it's essentially saying is is that because it was given to the Jews, it keeps Israel and Gentiles distinct And it keeps Israel and the church distinct. It is a line of distinction is what it is. But number four, this is when it starts to kind of creep over into our area. To reveal and show what sin is. If you read the law, 
You will recognize one thing real quick. You can't keep it. Real quick. And it's not because the law is bad. It's because I'm so bad. That's the inadequacy. B, to demonstrate the exceeding sinfulness of the flesh. My flesh is exceedingly sinful. C, to show that living by the law only breeds living that is fleshly. When you try to keep it, you just sin more. How many of God, I'm never going to act that way when somebody cuts me off again. Liar, right? You know it. The law that we even set for ourselves, we break it. God, I'll never do that again. Oh, we're self-condemning. How about the last one on the next page? To show that the flesh will never get better because it will always serve the law of sin. It will always lead to death. And it will always be profitless. The Christian life is never about our flesh getting better. It's never about us trying harder. It is always about trusting Christ more. Every day, every moment, every time. Every time. So now, if you look down below that, a common misunderstanding of the law, in that second little section in the New Testament, positionally, We are already true law keepers in Christ because he's kept the law perfectly on our behalf. It's a good verse for us to turn to. Let's turn to Romans 10 and look at verse 4. You can just mark it in your Bible as something to remember whenever we have somebody that wants to try to keep us under the law or perform certain things in order to be accepted before a holy God. That's legalism is what that is. Romans chapter 10. If the person next to you is having trouble finding it, be a good Christian and help them. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. I love the sound of pages flipping. Thank you. I'm not hearing. Thank you for not doing that. Verse 4. All right, Tom, calm down. Tom and his page flipping up here. For Christ, there's your hope. For Christ is the end of of the law but not just for no reason for what praise the lord right abraham believed god it was accredited to him as righteousness christ has accomplished the law in our behalf and when we believe in him and we are identified with him all of a sudden we are law keepers and did nothing i don't know about you but there's 613 commandments it's not just the 10 there's 603 after that that are clarifications Branching off of the ten. And we are all law, everybody in this room is a law keeper. Chief Mantha, you believe that? Okay, I just want to make sure. That's a different question for him, isn't it? Mm. By the way, keep an eye on this guy. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who what? Nothing got corrupted there, did it? We became law keepers because Christ kept the law by one way and one way only, and that was faith, period. Pretty simple. Now, positionally, that sets us up gravy, right? That's excellent. But practically, what does that look like? If you notice down at the next one, practically speaking, we are keeping the law when we operate in love with one another. Turn over three chapters. Romans chapter 13. Verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone. Now we could stop right there. I could pray and we could go home and I would get 40 emails about that, those four words, okay? But it's clear what it says, right? Owe nothing to anyone except... Your visa card, no. (laughs) Except to love one another. For, here's the reason why, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Positionally speaking, Christ has fulfilled the law on our behalf, and when we believe, we are righteous. Now here's a question. How are we declared righteous? Yeah, by faith is how that happened, but you've got to measure it. 
It's by Christ keeping the law, and therefore we get His righteousness. The law is a standard of which to measure. Does that make sense? The law is the perfect standard of God. It's a measuring tool. Practically speaking, how do we fulfill the law? We love our neighbors as ourselves. Here's the interesting thing. When you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not breaking the law. Let me ask you this. Let's, put, let's flip it another way. How much do you love you? Think about it for just a second. Scale of 1 to 10, probably a 20, right? I love me a lot. Well, here's the thing. Love your neighbor that way. By doing so, you're fulfilling the law. Practically. All of it can be summed up in that. Loving your neighbor as yourself. So the church has dealt with this problem of should the church keep the law for years? And I wanted to give you all that as like a prep in your mind for what we're getting ready to see. So turn back one book to Acts 15 and this is where we will camp out. I'm sorry, but everything I just told you was actually the end of last week's sermon. But because we clocked in at an hour and 12 minutes, I felt it was good to pray and go home. You guys laugh, but I see behind your smiles. Just kidding. You guys have been very patient with me. Thank you. Acts chapter 15. Some of you have a heading at the top of this. It probably says the council at Jerusalem or the Jerusalem council, something like that. This is a pivotal moment in early Christianity. It occurs about A.D. 50. Uh, Jesus probably ascended into heaven around 27 A.D. That's probably when that happened. Nobody really knows for sure when it was chronicled at that time, but probably around 27, 28 A.D. And so we've had a period of time that's taken place for the longest time. Uh, Up until a little bit after 44 A.D., it was only the Jews who were hearing the gospel and believing. You have this early preaching by Peter that starts the church in Jerusalem. It manifests forward, and it's not until sometime after that 44 time it was probably more around 49 AD is when it was that Peter preached to the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and all of a sudden Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ and now the temptation at hand is well since they're Gentiles and there is a harsh streak of racism historically between the Jew and the Gentile since they're Gentiles they must be required to conform to a Jewish way of living in order to be considered acceptable before God. Now this is why there is a distinction between the church and Israel. It's because they started trying to mix the two and messed up the gospel in the process. So, go with me here. Acts chapter 15 verse 1. Some men came down from Judea. Now Judea is down south. That's where Jerusalem is located if we were to mentally think of our geography there. And they began teaching the brethren. Now stop. The sheer fact that they were given an audience to teach the brethren shows that they're already saved people. They would not give permission to unsaved people to teach. Now where are they coming from Judea to? They're coming to Antioch. And Antioch is Paul's home church. It's where he started his ministry. It's where he was a part of the preaching and teaching process. And that's where he was set aside by the Holy Spirit and commissioned to go out for his first missionary journey. So Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, you always like somebody that's labeled by their spiritual gift, right? That's a good guy to have around. You go on their first missionary journey together, first missionary journey that's ever been done. They go around and win a ton of Gentiles to faith in Christ and start establishing churches, training people, loving them, encouraging unity in the faith. Man, it's explosive. It's awesome. And they come back and they tell the home church what's going on and everybody rejoices and woo, Jesus, right? Everybody's excited about it. Testimony meetings matter. When people are sharing what God has been doing, it matters. So now... They have the guest speakers come. Hey, guys, we're from the church down in Judea. Oh, come on in. What do you want to share with the brethren? They started teaching the brethren. Here's the content of their message. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And all the Gentiles in the room went... (laughs) 
man, it got real serious real quick. So you didn't know you were going to have as much fun at church this morning, did you? Now, why would this be scary? Look what happens. Look at the reaction. Well, the obvious reason why this would be scary. (laughs) For the recording to be repeated in eternity on the internet, that was Megan Breakbush who giggled at that. So, (laughs) And Mitch, do not edit that out or I will pray against you this week. All right. Verse 2. (laughs) verse 2 and when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension a sharp sharp dispute with them is the idea and debate with them the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue now that's important for two reasons number one notice that immediately an argument broke out Christians aren't supposed to argue about the gospel we are If the gospel has become polluted in some way to where it is not faith alone, you argue about it. You argue lovingly, but you argue. Because when you corrupt the gospel of faith alone in Christ alone, you no longer have a gospel that saves. That's dangerous. When you start requiring a work for acceptance with God, you've now given them a reason to boast in accomplishing their own eternal standing does that make sense dangerous it's dangerous it's essentially pushing jesus over on the cross and saying hey move over here i'm going to die a little bit and make this right that's not anywhere that we want to be that's not anything that we could pay and the audacity of thinking that makes no sense in light of a holy god who hates sin so we got serious ramifications here it's going on and so paul and barnabas Start disputing with them. Now think about this. They just got back from what? Missionary journey, right? What message do you think they were preaching to everybody as they traveled? Hey guys, believe in Jesus and get circumcised and you're good to go. Was that what they were preaching? No, but they just got back and they were having a powwow about how wonderful the works of God were in saving Gentile people. And now they're being told from people from Judea that their message is wrong. Now, why would that matter? Well, the Jerusalem church was the one from Acts 2, right? It's the one that was the first church. It was the first one founded. It's the one where Peter and John and James, who actually walked with Jesus all throughout his earthly ministry, were residing there and teaching and discipling people. So when they show up from Judea, there's an air of authority. Wait a second. That's not what we were preaching. We we were telling them this, that it's faith alone and Christ alone. No, 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 no. Got to keep the law of Moses. Well, man, they did come from the Jerusalem church. So what do they decide to do? Let's put together a delegation. Let's send them down to the Jerusalem church. Let's check with these people for two reasons. Number one, the apostles are there, and they'll know. And number two, that's where these guys said they were from. So let's check them out. Somebody's wrong somewhere. It's not all roads lead to Jesus. So verse 3, therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia, which is interesting because Phoenicia is along the coast there up towards the north of the Mediterranean Sea, and Samaria. We know Samaria, right? Woman at the well, the middle area there between Judea and Galilee. Jews wouldn't go there because the half-breeds live there, and they're so racist they hate those people, right? But notice, describing... In detail, the conversion of the Gentiles, and they were bringing great joy to all the brethren. In other words, Paul and Barnabas jumped on the bus and took a praise tour down to Jerusalem. Hey, let's stop at this church and let's tell them about what God's done. Yeah, and everybody's having joy. Man, that's a word that they didn't use much anymore, is it? But they were joyful hearing what God was doing amongst a people that everybody had pretty much been convinced there was no hope for them. And here is God coming in with the grace of the gospel and bringing hope to the hopeless. How amazing is that? So moving on, verse 4, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they excuse me, were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. In other words, that was the final night of the praise tour. They wanted to share the testimony with them about what God was doing. Now imagine, 
They're sharing it in detail. They show up to this church. They got a matter to discuss, but the first thing they want to do is talk about the greatness of God and what he is doing amongst them in their ministry so that everybody can be encouraged. Everybody can rejoice. Everybody has got this thank you, Lord, mentality about it. And then you got some people that stand up and they got something to say, right? Look what happens. Verse 5, but some of the sect of the Pharisees, now we remember those guys, right? We remember them from the gospel. And then all of a sudden, we all get angry eyebrows and the little fang teeth come out. We're like, ugh, I don't like those guys. But hold on just a second. Look what it says after that. Who had what? Uh Uh-oh, stop. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. They were Pharisees, yeah. But if them leaving being Pharisees was conditioned upon their salvation, then we're adding law to their conversion. Everybody see that? No, they were still involved in this whole pharisaical religious ordeal, this council that was set up, these Jewish know-it-alls that were set up. But they had heard the gospel and they had believed and they were born again. Why? Because the only condition for salvation is faith in Christ. That's it. So let's be consistent with the text. It says here, who had believed, they stood up and here's what they said. Now notice, saved people who have gotten the gospel wrong. It is, what's the word, church? Necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Oh, hold on. In chapter 15, verse 1, the requirement was to be circumcised. That's bad enough, right? Now they travel down to the church that has the guys that walked with Jesus. And the poison has infiltrated some people there. And because it's mentioned that they're Pharisees, makes you think that it probably came from a distortion among the other Pharisees. You see how that works? They were influencing the believers away from the truth of the gospel is probably what took place. No, no, no. It's not just, you know, hey, 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 we just came from Antioch. Some of your guys came up and told us we had to be circumcised to be saved. Oh, that's not right. That's not right. You got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. Everybody knows that. Is that true? Is that true? Notice the problem is even worse the closer they got to home base. So how do you deal with it? Verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together and looked into this matter. In other words, the leadership called a timeout and had a meeting. Churches hate meetings, but in this case, it was important, right? Verse 7, after there had been much debate, a lot of back and forth, The issue's generating a lot of discussion, and chances are emotions were running high in the midst of the whole thing. And I love it. Of all the people to stand up, you and I wouldn't have chosen Peter to speak, right? We're like, oh, that's a guy cut off that ear. We don't want that guy standing up, right? It's like me trying to get Tom to preach. I don't know. But anyway, if I didn't have you to pick on, I don't know what I'd do. Um, Sermons are probably shorter. All right, moving on. I'm glad you caught that joke. Thank you. Praise God. Uh, After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and he said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now pause. This verse is packed with some goody-goody stuff, okay? Notice that Peter's not tooting his own horn. Notice that Peter's not saying, look at me. Peter's saying, early on, The Lord made a choice between us. He commissioned me to go and talk to some people, right? I mean, isn't that what it said? He was chosen. What was he chosen for? A task that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word and believe. Does everybody notice that Peter's got the gospel straight? Faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of Christ. You hear the gospel and you believe. People don't get saved any other way. They hear This is why evangelism is so important. We tell someone the gospel, they hear it, and then they now have to respond. Do I believe that's true? Do I have a conviction that that is true, or do I not? Belief or unbelief? So notice he's got that straight. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. Does everybody remember whenever Jesus has the conversation with the apostles, he says that I'm going to establish my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? And he says, and Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. A lot of people have said that the rock there is the gospel. I disagree with that. I think who he's talking to is Peter in particular. 
And the reason is, is because in the very next verse, he uses the word you, and it's in the singular. You will receive the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And it's singular. Now, am I saying that Peter is the Pope? No. Do not, describe, do not ascribe to that whatsoever. That's tradition, not Bible. Okay? Has no validity. But what am I saying? Well, think about it. In Acts chapter 2, who stood up and preached to everybody by the power of the Holy Spirit? Peter. And the Jews were one to Christ, were they not? 3,000 that day. If you got a problem with megachurches, you got a problem with Acts 2. Can you imagine if 3,000 people came to Christ in one day here? We wouldn't know what to do. 3,000 Jews. You couldn't even fix some barbecue in that case. That's rough. I couldn't handle, I don't know if I want to be part of that church. Woo. Barbecue is where I draw the line. <laughs> Just kidding. But then, later on in Cornelius' house, everybody remember the sheet? He has the dream of the sheet that's let down, all the animals. Peter, don't call anything that I've made unclean. And then he receives word, come to Cornelius' house. He shows up, he shares the gospel, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they, and they all stand back and they go, good grief, God is saving the Gentiles. Who preached that sermon? Peter. Exactly as Jesus said. He established the church first with the Jews through Peter at Acts 2. He established the church with the Gentiles, all becoming one, Acts 2, through Peter. The person who probably failed Jesus most, with the exception of Judas, was used the greatest for his glory. Incredible. Incredible the grace of God to use us when we might feel otherwise unusable. So notice that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. Verse 8, And God, who knows the heart, testified. Now stop. What does it mean to testify? What does that mean to testify? What? Raise your hand. Testify. Anybody? I know you guys are pulling up dictionary.com right now and typing that in. What? To tell. God is telling something. Now pay attention to the context of what's going on here. They heard the word of the gospel. They believed. He's talking about the incident at Cornelius' house. Notice this, verse 8. And God, who knows the heart. Does that ring a bell with you for a second? With the heart one believes and is justified. Remember that from Romans 10? With the heart one believes and is justified. God, who knows the heart, look what happens here. Testified. He's got something to say about it. He's giving a decisive witness. I mean, it's where we get the word testimony, right? It's you telling the truth about something that took place. When you take the stand to give an account, you are a witness who gives a testimony of what you saw. And you are to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God, right? Now watch this. God is testifying about something. He testified to them, the Gentiles, and how did he testify to them? Giving them what? The Holy Spirit indwelling is a testimony from God that you are accepted by Him. Does everybody see that? When we talk about you hear the gospel, you believe, and immediately you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking about the Ziploc bag that fails you sealed, okay? You are sealed up, airtight, never to be broken again. The Holy Spirit now resides in you. Why? Because He is a deposit guaranteeing that one day you will be with Him face to face, never to be gone again. It is guaranteeing your future redemption so notice this this idea the holy spirit has given it is a testimony of god of your acceptance pause go back how were they accepted they heard the word and what believe pretty simple right so moving on here just as he did all or sorry just as he also did to us who's us jews what event do you think he's referring to at that moment well the upper room probably but probably more specifically, the idea of the whole of the church, since they're in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2. In other words, God gave the Holy Spirit in Acts 10 to the Gentiles, just as He did in Acts 2 to the Jews. It wasn't different. They didn't have different requirements. Fireworks didn't go off here, and then like weird dancing bunnies came out over here. It's not weird. There's nothing different about this. He says here, verse 9, And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by what? Your heart is cleansed by faith. Did you know that? I mean, that's what it says. 
By believing in the gospel, their hearts were cleansed by faith. God, who knows the heart, gave them the Holy Spirit to testify of their acceptance in eternity by him. Babies are getting saved. So moving on. Verse 10. Now therefore, now therefore, test church. What's therefore, therefore? And you have to say it with a southern accent or it does not count. What is therefore, therefore? I'm glad you asked. Because of that, notice what Peter says to them. Why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? This is the seriousness of the matter. Peter gives them an example. Think with me. He's saying, brothers, God commissioned me to preach. And when the Gentiles first heard the gospel and believed, I was the one preaching. And they didn't get saved any way that was any different from when I preached in Acts 2 and the Jews heard the good news and they believed and were saved. There's no difference. So since there's no difference from those two events that have taken the Jew and the Gentile and have destroyed what separated them and put them together in one new body that is the church of which God is using to reach the world, why in the world are you trying to drag in all this stuff and place a weight on them that keeps them from their acceptance before God mentally? Were they accepted by God? Yes, but notice, when you try to introduce works into the gospel, it robs assurance. You cannot be certain of your eternal destiny if you're always trying to perform to be accepted. And one of the greatest problems we have in the church at large, especially in America, is that we keep performing so that we hope that we're acceptable by God. Or God must be mad at me because I haven't been praying enough. Or God must be mad at me because I haven't been reading or not. God's not mad at you. Every problem he had with sin has been taken care of at the cross. That's been relieved. You stand in a place of grace. Don't deserve to be there. Can't ever work your way to be there. Probably shouldn't be there but you are there. And here's the amazing paradoxical thing about it. God wants you there. So notice Peter's point. Guys, if you bring the law in, you have robbed the church of grace. You've robbed them of their acceptance. Because I tell you this, a a Christian that has no assurance will not grow. They're too busy waffling around trying to get accepted instead of realizing that because they're already accepted, they can now live a life that they never could have lived before. They actually get to live Jesus' abundant life. Now, here, in conjunction with all y'all, the church, So let's finish this up. Verse 11. But we believe. Verse 11. But we believe. We're convinced. We have a conviction about this. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Anybody deserve to be saved? No, that's what makes it grace, right? Putting it forward. Him even offering it. Him stooping down to provide the means of restitution for sinful people. Grace, 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 grace. Let it roll off your tongue. It's beautiful. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Now watch this. In the same way as they also are. There's no difference. They're sinners just like we are. They're saved by faith just like we are. And Jesus died for them just like He died for us. There's no difference. Verse 12, I love it. All the people kept silent. I like that. And they were listening 
to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders, because notice, signs and wonders verify God's approval amongst them, God had done through them among the Gentiles. What place does the law have for the Christian? None. 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 And every time that you look to it or look to your performance for some reason why God should accept you, you condemn yourself. Because you're not claiming at that moment what Christ has done. Now, does that mean that you're not saved when you do that? No, it's not what I said. I'm saying that you are trying to look for another means of acceptance with the Holy God when you're already accepted by a Holy God because of His Holy Son. The great exchange has taken place. Our sin has been put upon the cross. The Savior's righteousness is freely distributed to all who believe. So I have two questions to wrap it up. Number one, have you messed up the gospel? Are you guilty? Do you think that maybe it's good in some way or admirable to encourage them to keep on? They, they got to get these works down. Well, they're just not acting right. So we got to give them a couple of hoops to jump through to know to verify that they're really saved. Pause. Who gives the testimony whether or not someone's saved? God does. God's going to give that speech. It's not my job to verify people. Don't zip up your Bibles. I'll keep you here another 45 minutes. <laughs> That's the law. It is. It is. I'll keep you here 45 minutes, but I'll let Pastor Steve go, right? Don't miss this, church. Don't miss this, because I know the tendency. The tendency that we have in us is, man, I've heard this before. Man, we talk about this all the time. Good grief, it's the same thing Pastor Steve told me. It's because it doesn't get old. And it daily gets corrupted. I'm not kidding you. I deal weekly with people who have messed up the gospel. Weekly. Not here. Not all the time. But I deal weekly with people who want to have some kind of interaction because the grace that I preach is just too free. It's just too good to be true. Is it? It is. It is too free and it's too good to be true because sometimes I don't understand it. But does that make it not true? Oh, man. If anything, that's just how much God loves us. God demonstrates His love for us and that while we were still sinners, stained, wallowing, loving our sin, rationalizing our sin, given reasons why our view is right and God's view is wrong, even while we were in the midst of doing that, Christ still died. Eternity was against Him. And He still died. Public opinion didn't want him, and he still died. Everybody had a better way, and he still died. This PhD wrote a paper about why Jesus was wrong, and he still died. Everybody said, I'm going to live how I want to, and God, I don't want anything to do with what you want to tell me. And he still died. I'm thankful he didn't need my approval to get on the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he despised the cross and endured the shame, and now he is sitting at the right hand of the Father on high. Salvation has been provided for you and me, full and free. Have you messed up the gospel? If you have, repent. Get your thinking corrected about what the gospel truly is. But number two, which branches to it and is as equally, if not even more important, are you sharing this good news? Are you sharing the free gift of salvation? Raise your hand if you know a lost person. 
Okay, I just want to make sure who was all included on this if you're doing that thing, right? If you're just hanging out with saved people, come talk to me. But are you sharing the good news? Some people make fun, but are you using tracks? <laughs> Not that anybody would know who was making fun of me about tracks. But tracks preach the gospel when you can't be there. There's no reason not to give them out. And the people that shop at Walmart, as much as the employees at Walmart need it as well. So when you go there, leave them. You go to Aldi, leave them. Wherever you're at, leave them. Is it good to give out our pens? Yeah, but that advertises our church. I'd rather advertise Jesus. Have that conversation. Pray that God will give you the courage if that's the reason why you're not doing it. But those conversations need to be had because eternity is at stake. And the gospel is too glorious to not share. While we were sinners, Christ died. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you've given a clear event in history where this matter of law-keeping was debated, rolled over, fought through, planned out, dissected. And the evidence was clear. Everyone is saved by hearing the gospel and believing. You give testimony to this by giving your Holy Spirit graciously to indwell us. Father, you have commissioned the church with a purpose, with a task, with a vocation to fulfill. And that is that the gospel needs to always be on our lips. Lord, if we've gotten it wrong, correct our thinking. And if we're not sharing it, correct our action or our use, our stewarding of our opportunities. Every person needs to be told about the gospel because that's exactly who Jesus died for. So thank you, God, for forgiving our sin problem. Thank you, God, for doing graciously, amazingly beyond all we could ask and think. Thank you, God, for loving us and sealing us for a future day when Jesus will return and call us up to Him and we will be with Him always. Thank you, God, for hope. And we pray it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I don't really have a lot of announcements today, but the one thing I do want to draw your attention to is the um, clipboard that's out on the Welcome Center. It is for membership class. If you've been coming, you got questions or want to learn more about the church, that kind of thing, please sign up. Please come. You do have to go through the class to become a member, but you don't have to become a member just because you went through the class. It's important. So come, ask your questions, hang out. Get to know all about it. Chuck's going to be there. I always think that's fun to bring up because Chuck's a fun guy to be around. Way more fun than Tom. Tom won't be there. <laughs> Everybody's going to sign up now because Tom's not going to be there, right? Just kidding. I love you, man. I'm sorry. I think I'll I'm sorry. So, But because of our joyous salvation, let's stand and let's sing together. You may not like holding hands. Awesome. Germex is out in the foyer, right? <laughs> But let's rejoice in this.
me, please. Father, we thank You for the provision of our glorious Savior, Jesus, our Passover Lamb, the One who takes the sins of the world. Thank You, God, that Your Word constantly teaches us the assurance of our salvation, Your great love for us, and the free and full gift of a sufficient Savior. Father, thank You that our works are rendered useless But Lord, You have provided redemption full and free. And Father, this news is good news we should be telling people. So please, God, give us opportunities and give us eyes to see and hearts that are compelled to let people know that You love them, You've died for them, and You offer them eternal life by faith alone in Christ alone. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.